As many of you know, I am the fifth child of eight children who were raised in a small suburban house by a stay-at-home mom and a public school teacher dad. We didn't have a lot, but more importantly, we didn't waste what we had. For example, clothes were never thrown away. They were worn, altered, then handed down, and possibly altered again. We may have been the funny looking kids at school, but good clothes were never wasted. Every time we left a room in our house, we turned out the lights or we'd be scolded for wasting electricity. We didn't buy a lot of extras because that would be a waste of money. And to this day, I drink all the milk in the bottom of my oatmeal bowl because wasting milk was considered a felony. I can't tell you how many times I heard the phrase, milk is gold. You would never throw such a precious commodity down the drain. What a waste. And the lessons we learned by conserving practical things like clothes and electricity and money and milk carried over into other areas of our lives. Sometimes it was difficult to relax and just do nothing because that would have been considered a waste of time. So we read books, played music, got jobs, signed up for extracurricular activities and made sure our homework was done so we'd make good grades. We also played outside and watched way too much TV, but we were raised to be productive people who learned how to make the most effective and efficient use of our time as well as our resources. I still take great pride in my ability to get my work done in the most productive and timely manner possible. But Jesus said, when it comes to the work of God, effectiveness and efficiency are not necessarily the best approach. If we really want to make a positive difference in this world, we have to learn how to live in a way that seems wasteful. Now Jesus was having a bad day. It was a Sabbath and according to God's law, it was a day of rest. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. And on this particular Sabbath day, Jesus and his hungry disciples had been criticized by the religious leaders for plucking heads of grain as they were walking through a field because they didn't have anything else to eat. But plucking grain was considered work and you were not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Shortly after that, Jesus healed a man with a withered hand in the synagogue, and the religious leaders were so angry that Jesus had the audacity to heal a man, which was considered work, on the Sabbath that they left the synagogue and conspired to kill him. So Jesus left that place, and the gospel says that Many crowds followed him and he cured them all, including a demoniac who couldn't see or speak. And the crowds were amazed. But when the religious leaders heard about it, they accused Jesus of being in cahoots with the devil. And while Jesus was trying to explain why that didn't make any sense, they demanded proof that Jesus was actually doing the work of God and not some evil entity that was out to destroy the only way of life that they'd ever known. Give the guy a break. Jesus was out doing the work that he was created and called to do to the very best of his ability. And there were people who had witnessed that work and seen the miraculous wonder of God's love with their very own eyes and yet still didn't believe. Which might make you wonder, what's the point? Why work so hard if these people aren't at least going to appreciate your effort? Maybe, Jesus, you'd be more effective if you worked a little more efficiently.
Maybe spend more time teaching the people who actually want to hear the word of God and less time arguing with the people who want to see you dead. But Jesus said that when it comes to the work of God, effectiveness and efficiency are not necessarily the best approach. If we want to make a positive difference in this world, we have to learn how to live in a way that seems wasteful. So Jesus went out, sat beside the sea, and so many people came to hear what he had to say that he got into a boat out on the water, sat down, and told them a parable. Now let's pause and remember that a parable is not a nice little story with a moral at the end. That's a fable. A parable is a story with a twist, as in stick the knife in your gut and twist it. It's a story that's meant to shake up your world and shatter your preconceptions. Listen, Jesus said. Don't just hear these words with your ears, but really take them in and let your understanding of them change the way you live. A sower went out to sow. In other words, a farmer went out to plant his crops and as he went along, he would reach into the sack that he wore on his back, grab a handful of seeds and then fling them out in all directions. He didn't carefully bend down and plant them in neat little rows. He threw them out wherever he went along the way. Some of the seeds fell on the walking path that wound its way between the fields. But the path was so hard and so packed down from being walked on that he may as well have thrown seed out in the church parking lot. There was absolutely no chance that seed was going to break through the soil and grow. So birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground that had just enough topsoil for the seed to shoot up quickly. But in that area of Palestine, there was a layer of limestone just under the surface. So when the sun came out, the soil didn't have enough depth to sustain it, and it was scorched. Other seed fell in the briar patch. There was plenty of good soil there, but as the seeds began to shoot up and grow, the thorns grew up alongside and choked them. So far, this crop has been one disaster after another, and the crowds who were listening assumed that the farmer would be punished for such wastefulness. But then Jesus throws in the twist and says that some of the seed fell on good soil and produced a crop beyond anybody's wildest imagination. A good crop in that day would yield four to tenfold. An exceptional crop might yield 15. But Jesus said the seed that fell on good soil brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. All right, Jesus, I hear you. But it sounds like you are asking me to take my time, my resources, and my precious commodities and just throw them away in what seems to be a bunch of hopeless situations. The sower's methods were certainly effective in the end, but wouldn't it be more efficient and possibly even more effective if we took the time to evaluate the soil before we started throwing out that seed? Wouldn't it be better to concentrate all of our efforts on what we know will produce the best yield instead of wasting 75% of our initial investment on the hard, rocky, thorny ground? Jesus said that when it comes to the work of God, effectiveness and efficiency may not be the best approach. And if we're going to make a positive difference in this world, we have to learn to live in a way that seems wasteful because the work of God is indiscriminately extravagant. Several years ago I attended a workshop on church growth at a denominational convention. 
the presenter was an author of a best-selling book that outlined seven strategies for successfully growing a church, which included what is now commonly known as target evangelism. He said churches that focused their limited time and resources on developing programs for a specifically targeted demographic, like young professional couples with small children, grew faster than churches that tried to meet the needs of a wider variety of people. He had fancy charts and stunning statistics, and it certainly made sense from a business perspective. But he'd forgotten that the work of God is indiscriminately extravagant. The sower can sow wherever he wants because his resources are unlimited. He doesn't have to pick and choose who gets the seed and who doesn't. He doesn't have to evaluate the soil's quality or potential, who's worthy and who's not worthy. No ground is declared undeserving because there's enough seed for everyone. And the sower wants everyone to have the seed because the seed is good. I was speaking with Tom Smith earlier this week because he grew up on a farm. And I wanted to know how a farmer could tell if the seed he was about to plant was good. And he told me that before a large planting, a farmer will do a germination test by planting 100 seeds in 100 pockets of soil to see what percentage of the seed will sprout. I said, well, what percentage is needed to determine if a batch of seed is good? And he said, mid to high 90s. 95 to 99% of the seed has to sprout in order for it to be determined good. But Jesus said that the seed the sower plants sprouts 100% of the time. The soil makes no difference. That seed sprouted on good soil, rocky soil, and thorny soil. The seed on the hard path didn't have a chance because it was eaten by birds. But one scholar noted that the birds will eventually process and dispose of that seed away from the hard path where it will have another chance of sprouting because the seed is good. We may not get to see the results right away, but we can rest assured that it will eventually produce because the seed is good. It never fails. Later, Jesus explains that the seed is the word of God, indiscriminately and extravagantly sown in the hearts of all God's people. Even the hard-hearted, shallow, prickly people of this planet that struggle, like we all do, with the rocky, chaotic, insecure circumstances of life. And let's face it, some people struggle more than others, but that never stops God from sowing his word of love, even in what appears to be the most hopeless situations, because God knows his word never fails. And when that word is really taken in and allowed to flourish in the deepest, darkest hidden parts of our hearts, it will bear a harvest of joy beyond our wildest imagination. Our job is not to sow the seed. God's already sown it. Our job is to nurture what God has already sown so the seed can bear fruit that will nourish and sustain the world so that everyone can live this life and live it abundantly. Which means we're going to have to do the hard work of the kingdom. Water some dirt. Remove some rocks. Pull up some thorns. Pay attention to what's happening around us and identify the obstacles that prevent us and the people around us from living this life the way we were all created and called to live. And then start removing those obstacles just like Jesus, the Word made flesh, 
taught us to do. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and those in prison. Forgive the people who hurt you. Reach out to the people who threaten you. Welcome all the people who have been pushed aside and labeled worthless by the rest of society and continue to do it over and over and over again. It will not be easy. We will be opposed, criticized, and possibly even crucified. There may even be occasions when we feel like we are throwing our time, our resources, and our precious commodities down the drain. But our efforts will not be wasted because the work of God never fails. Thomas Long says, The message to the church is that the gift of a great harvest awaits them. That when the kingdom of heaven comes in power, the witness and discipleship of the people of God, always fragile and at peril in the world, will be magnified by the generosity of God into a fruitful, extravagant, and altogether gracious yield. Therefore, the church is called to waste itself, to throw grace around like there is no tomorrow precisely because there is a tomorrow and it belongs to God. Let all those who have ears to hear listen. Amen.